dropping stuff all over the place here. Let me get this set up here. All right. Hopefully you can hear me now. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Gathering Place. Today's uh, message is brought to you by Cheap Coffee. Cheap Coffee is available everywhere. You go into grocery stores, you go into Home Depot, you go into your grandmother's house, there's Cheap Coffee. So Cheap Coffee ke keeps the world going around, and today, Cheap Coffee is what's keeping me going. Hey, let's jump into the Bible in just a moment, but before we do, I want to thank you for joining us. I don't know how you found us, but I'm glad you did. And so if you want to know more about The Gathering Place, it's a local church here in Folsom, California. You can go to our website, tgpchurch.com, and you can find out more about what's going on. Uh, I love having you online, speaking right to you in your house, in your phone, but I'd also like to meet you in person. And so we are gathering in person indoors on Sunday mornings. 9.30 at our local church campus. And uh, it's a time for us to come together. We're worshiping God. We're getting into the Word. We're seeing each other. We're encouraging one another. Uh, I think it's important for us in the times that we live in that we would gather together and uh, build one another up. So this is what's happening. I'd love to have you join us Sunday mornings, 9.30. Again, go to our website. You can find out more information about us. Hey, let's jump into the Word. I got my Bible right here. And uh, I want you to grab yours as well. Let's say something out loud together about our Bibles. Let's say this. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. We do that and we say that together because this is no ordinary book. This book right here is, is the Word of God. It's not just a history book, a comic book, a, a fictional story. It's not just a collection of, of principles and morals, but it's the very Word of God that has the ability to transform our lives. So that's why we remind ourselves it's no ordinary book. Open in your Bible with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Actually, back up a little bit to chapter 10. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I, I walked through this passage of Scripture with you. And then last week in service, my wife took time to uh, teach through it, and then we worshiped together afterwards. And I was uh, traveling during that time, but I heard it was such a powerful time of worship. You know, there's something about receiving the word and then worshiping that really causes us to, to take it in and respond to God properly. And so sometimes that's how we do it when we gather together on Sunday mornings. We take time to worship after receiving the word. Uh, today, maybe you'll take time to respond at the end as well. Hebrews chapter 10 uh, says in verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. So, uh, the author right here, he's speaking to the believers, the, the church. He's speaking to us. It's not even just speaking to individuals, but he's speaking to a collective group of followers of Christ. That's something that's important about the church. The church is not made up of just individuals as, hey, I'm the church, you're the church in the sense of uh, privately, but it's corporately. The church is a called out group of people that would gather together and identify with, a, with, with Jesus, what he's done, his death and resurrection, uh, his um, purpose, his mission on earth for us as well. There's a number of things that the church does that uh, identifies it as the church. So the apostle here that is writing it is saying to the church, hey, we come to God we come into the very presence of God through a new and living way because Jesus gave his life on the cross. If you take the time to read, you'll get that from the context. So he says this, though. He says, and since we have a great high priest over the, the house of God, three things. Number one, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure Water, And so let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. First thing he's calling us to do as the, those who are gathering in the name of Jesus, those who belong to him, we've got to draw near to God. 
and we can do it with a uh, with full confidence, a sincere heart, right? We can do it with a uh, um, freedom from a guilty conscience, or we can do it with a clear conscience, a clear conscience that has been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus. What's it? What's he mean by that? Well, sometimes our conscience convicts us. Why? Well, because we do things that we know are wrong, and we can start to identify ourselves by what we do. And there's a problem in that because when you start to identify yourself by what you do, then you miss out on what Jesus has done. And you start to look at yourself as, hey, I did good, so I'm good, or I did bad, so I'm bad. And it all messes with our conscience. And when our conscience is guilty, it'll cause us to draw back from God. And so there in, in the book of uh, 1 Peter, in chapter 1, Peter tells the, the followers of Christ, he says, hey, avoid fleshly lusts because they wage against, they wage war against the soul. And what he's not telling us is, hey, if you fall into sin or you give into sin, well, then you have damned your soul. <laughs> he's not saying that, yeah, you've lost or, or anything like that. He says it wages war against the soul. It, it will beat you up. Now, here's the deal with that. If you are waging war against your soul, you're going to be uh, approaching your walk with the Lord with this sense of guilt in the background. And when you have this sense of guilt, you're not going to come to Him with full confidence. If you don't come to God with full confidence, then really what you're not doing is coming to Him in faith. If you don't come to God in faith, understand this, faith is the currency of the kingdom. God doesn't answer prayer based on our need, based on how desperate we are, based on how much we plead. God responds to faith, not because he's trying to get us to earn it or prove it. It's just the way it works. It's just the way he works. He operates by faith and he's given us a scripture and he's, he tells us this over and over. And so when we have a guilty conscience, we're not going to approach God in faith, in that full confidence. So, when we recognize that Jesus, his blood, his gift of himself as a sacrifice has dealt with our sin once and for all, for all time, only one sacrifice he had to make, which is what the previous portion of this pas passage is pointing to. It's saying that, that these priests, they used to go every single day and offer sacrifices, but Jesus did it once and for all so that he would perfect us who are being made holy. And so he's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. And he says, you right there as a follower of Jesus, as a, as a born again believer, you can draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith because he has shed his blood. Now receive that for your conscience, having your conscience sprinkled, your guilty conscience, be free, be cleansed from that. So not only are you um, completely forgiven by God, but there's something about when, when you recognize that uh, this, and he frees up your conscience as well. He frees that up. So, you know, sometimes you, for example, you get into a fight, you get into a disagreement with somebody, you did something wrong, you said some stuff, and they, they forgive you, right? You said some stuff that was bad, I should say. You asked forgiveness, and they forgive you. And, and so you're thankful, you, got, you made it right, you did the right thing. They forgave you. They said, I, I am forgiving you of this, but yet you feel bad. Well, just because you feel bad doesn't mean you're forgiven. And that, let me back that up. That didn't make sense, did it? Okay, just because you feel bad does not mean you are not forgiven. That's the right way to say it. You might still feel bad about what you did, and you might even be a little sheepish or um, even embarrassed or shamed by what you did, but it doesn't mean that you're not forgiven. So that person who forgave you, if they've forgiven you, they said, you owe me nothing. I forgive you. I'm releasing you from the debt. I get it. You did wrong, but I love you. I forgive you. I'm not holding it against you. There is nothing separating you from me on their part. But on your part, you aren't so confident. And why is that? Because you have a guilty conscience. 
Now, sometimes the reality is we just feel bad and it takes some time to get over that. Well, we understand that on the natural, uh, but with God, it can carry over into that relationship as well. Like we just feel bad about what we've done. Or sometimes we feel guilty because we're, maybe we're not living uh, the way that in a worthy manner. You know, the Bible says that we're to live worthy of the calling that we've received. And so if we're not living in a way that we know honors God, we're living below our, our purpose, we're living below our potential. And so those are the things that are going to cause us to really back away in our relationship with God. Not because He is backed away from us or that He has he is at an, you know holding us at an arm's length, but in our minds we know we know right. You know this. I know this. That person sitting next to you, they know this. Maybe there's no one next to you. I don't know. Well, you have this guilty conscience uh, because either a you are doing something wrong, <laughs> and what do you do? What do you do if you're doing something wrong? Well, you do what the scripture tells you to do. The, the Bible says this. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so this, this is kind of basic for us, but the reality is uh, we don't always do this. We hold on to it and we continue to walk in darkness. We don't bring our sin to God and bring it to the light. Why is that? Well, because we're embarrassed or ashamed or, let's be honest, we like sinning, and so we want to hold on to that. And the reality, though, is you'll never get free from it if you won't admit it, confess it to God. This is sin. It's wrong, and I'm sorry. And let me speak to some of you who are saying, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> like, I want to do it some more. Uh, go and, and pray and ask God to give you the desire. The Scripture says that God, it, it's God who is at work within you both to will and and to do according to his good pleasure. So not only does God help you do what he's called you to do, but he also helps you to will it. In other words, to desire it. So you can go to God and say, say, God, I am doing what's wrong. And I think I like doing what's wrong. I have this desire to do the wrong thing. But God, I know it's wrong. So Help me to do, to want to do what's right. Help me to want to do what's right. And then help me to do it. He already knows. He already knows what's going on on the inside. And so it's not going to be news to him. And he wants to help us. He wants to help us. He wants to bring people along your ways. He wants to bring, uh, you know, teaching resources, strength, times of, of refreshing your way to help you want to do the right thing and to walk in freedom from this. Here's the good part. The scripture is saying that we can. We can approach God with a clean conscience and uh, our hearts sprinkled, full assurance of faith. Our bodies cleansed. He's saying this, there's nothing that's holding you back. There's nothing that will limit you. There's nothing that will keep you away from, from the grace of God, the love of God, the, the, the wel welcoming arms of Father God because of what Jesus has done. And so this is what he's telling us. We need to just take this and say, okay, I receive that. I'm going to walk that out. But it doesn't stop there. There's a second thing it tells us to do after it says to, to draw near to God. Verse 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us hold unswervingly to the faith that we profess, because he who promised is faithful. Okay, let's think about that scripture for just a second. He who promised is God, right? That's who we're talking about. So we are holding fast or holding on tightly to the hope that we profess. We have hope and we profess it. We speak it ahead of time. We pro ahead, fess it. We fess it. We fess up, right? And so we profess our hope or we proclaim or we confess our hope. And the scripture is telling us here, in the days that you live in right now, you've got to hold on tightly to the hope that you are proclaiming. Because there are a lot of hope suckers out there. They will suck the hope right out of you. 
All you have to do is listen to the news, listen to your neighbor, listen to that complainer, you know, that sits across from you or whatever it is. There are people who want to suck the hope out of you. Don't let them do that. Hold on tightly. Never give up. Never give in. Don't let it go. God is telling you that if you will hold on to the hope that you are proclaiming, professing the hope that's within you, if you will hold on to that, something's going to happen. Well, he says, for he who promised is faithful. He's faithful to do what? He's faithful to keep his promises. So let's, let's back up a little bit. What are you holding on for hope to? I am holding on to for hope to the promises of God. I don't know if that was grammatically correct. Basically, this is what I'm saying. God made promises. My heart is holding on to those. I'm not going to let go of the promises of God. The promises of God are things that God has said he will do or will happen. The promises of God are words from God saying, this is how I operate. Now, the promises of God, let's just be honest, they don't always show up early, do they? They don't always show up as early as we would like to. Sometimes, but have you ever noticed, and maybe it's just me, but maybe it's you too. Have you ever noticed that it seems like the promises of God are not going to come to pass? It seems like the promises of God aren't happening for you. I don't know if you've noticed that. I've noticed it in my life. I've noticed it with other believers as well. Sometimes it looks like it's not going to happen. In fact, it's just going to take faith. But isn't that how it's supposed to work? It takes faith. If it didn't require faith, then it wouldn't require God. If it didn't require faith, then it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be a miracle. If it didn't require faith, it wouldn't be supernatural. It would, it would just be, hey, work hard, and then things are going to just turn out right. Sometimes they look like they're not going to turn out right, and even past the due date. But God comes through. Why is that? Because he who promised is faithful. What is God faithful to? He's faithful to his promises. Who are his promises concerning? His promises are concerning you. His promises are concerning me. His promises are concerning us. So for us, what do we do? We receive his promises by getting in the word, hearing them, speaking them, reading them, encouraging others, uh, listening to messages throughout the week, listening to Bible uh, teachings, you know, verses, all of that right there, it's building up our hope based on the promises of God. Now, the things that we need in life, uh, the things that are best for us, the things that would give us a, a desired outcome, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find that God has spoken concerning those things. What are you concerned about? What are people concerned about right now? In our nation, we're concerned, about, well, this is worldwide. We're concerned about our health, right? Well, what does God's word say about health? What has he promised concerning your health? There are a lot of hope suckers out there who would try to say, well, you just never know. God works in mysterious ways. There are things that God does that by all means, Man, it blows my mind, and it, would, it will yours too. But there are things that God says. He's made promises through the Scripture. And when it comes to health and healing, there is so much that He has spoken about, what He has done, what He desires, what His will is. I mean, you can think about from the Old Testament through the New, from the beginning to the end. Uh, one verse that comes to my mind right now. Jesus is walking. He's outside of the city. And there's this guy who had leprosy. Now, leprosy is a disease that would uh, require people to isolate. And if they came anywhere near, like if they see somebody that's at a relatively close distance, you know, like, like an, an earshot, they had to cover their mouth. They had to cover their mouth 
and they had to yell out, unclean, unclean. So they had to make sure that the person approaching them knew that they were coming into the proximity of somebody who had a contagious disease that was life-threatening. And they had to cover their mouth. They had to put on their mask, so to speak. I mean, maybe they had masks as well they would wrap around, but they were supposed to cover their mouth and yell out unclean so that that person would isolate. Okay, Jesus is walking, and he comes across a guy who is a, a, a leper, someone with leprosy. And, and he approaches Jesus because he's heard about who Jesus is and what he does. And what does he do? He approaches Jesus and he falls on his knees to worship him. And he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean or cleanse me from this leprosy. Heal me from this leprosy. What does Jesus say? Jesus looks at him and says, I'm busy. No, is that what he said? No, Jesus looked at the guy and he said, if you had done a better job at memorizing your Bible and being a good person, it would be my will. No, that's not what he said either. Well, I got another one. Maybe he said, yeah, you know, I will it for other lepers, but not you. Is that what Jesus said? No, 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 no. Come on, we got to read our Bible. This guy just shot out a, a little, little prayer. If you're willing, you can heal me, right? Jesus said this, I am willing, be healed. And he puts his hand on the guy. He reaches out. He doesn't back away and say, I'm going to heal you from a distance though he could, but Jesus intentionally reaches out, puts his hand on the guy. He touches him. This is a major no-no because we're talking about a contagious disease that could be airborne. It could be uh, transmitted through physical contact. They don't know all this stuff, but Jesus says, uh, I'm the healer. <laughs> and so I am willing, be healed. And the guy was healed at that very moment. If you're wondering if it's God's will or not to heal you or to keep you healthy, read the Bible. Find out the promises that God has made. Find out His will. Now, you can go and talk to people and base your belief on their experiences, but here's the deal. Our experiences are, um, are just that. They're our experiences. And sometimes we experience this, sometimes we experience that. That's how life works. But how does God work? See, God is consistent. And so when my experience doesn't line up with the Word of God, do I change my theology to fit my experience and say, well, clearly it's not God's will to heal me because I haven't been healed yet? Or do I look at my experience and say, what is it that I need to change in my theology to line up with God's word? And so this is foundational for us. And that's why the apostle is saying, don't let go of your hope. Don't stop speaking it. Don't back away from it because he who promised is faithful. So if you are, okay, if you are dealing with anything in life, which you are because you're alive, Find out what God's word says about it. You can look at this about peace, anxiety, depression, relational issues. Uh, you can look at it provision. You can look at it with lawsuits. You can look at it with growing crops, you know, your business. You can look at it with all of these things. Uh, understand that God speaks to just about every issue of your life that's probably important to you. He's made some promises. And so back, don't back down in that. And here's another reason is because those issues will be tested. Those things that God has promised to do in your life, they will be tested. Well, I'll give you an example of that if, as we read on. Um, we're going to jump down to verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 10. The, the writer says this, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. You were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. And other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. 
you sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. What is he saying? Hey, you remember, now he's speaking to people who have actually experienced this. <laughs> Do you remember when you first came to faith in Jesus and uh, you received the light and you stood your ground in great contest of faith and suffering, in, in the face of suffering. And so he's saying, you, because of the decision you made to follow Jesus, there is a tremendous amount of backlash, a tremendous amount of, of pressure on you to give in, and you stood your ground. I know when I gave my life to Jesus when I was 17 years old, I didn't experience persecution like threats on my life, or I didn't even experience rejection from my family. But I did experience the pressure from my peers to back down and go into my own lifestyle and to give up and to give in and uh, reject you know, my faith in Christ and what he's done for me. And so many of you can remember back to when you first made the decision to follow Jesus, that that was a similar experience for you. Now, he's, the, the writer here, though, is addressing these Christians, and he's saying, you guys, you had to make some decisions to do the things God's called you to do, to follow him, and uh, it cost you quite a bit. It wasn't just the embarrassment or the pressure to give in to an old lifestyle. But he said, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. You were insulted. You were persecuted. You might have been physically assaulted because of your faith. He's saying this now. Now, remember, he said, don't let go of your hope. Now he's saying, remember the early days when you held on to your hope? That there were times of testing. There were times of trials. There were times when you had to, you almost had to prove it. What he's saying, you had to prove that you, 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 you got your faith. And you, he's not saying you have to prove it to you have to prove it to God. Maybe he's saying you have to prove it to others. And sometimes you have to prove it to yourself. In the face of insult and persecution, I think about how um, willing we are to say, I'll do anything Jesus tells me to do. I'll live my life. I'll die for him. You know, I'll, I'll do all this. And then, uh, and then as Americans, we say things like, you know, no one, no one can take away my, my right to worship Jesus and serve Jesus. I'll never back down from that. And then with a little bit of pressure, a little bit of suggestion, a little bit of, of coercion from uh, others, whether it's, it's the local community or political leaders or whatever, a little bit of pressure, we cave. We cave. Okay, well, you know, I'm just back down because the government said. You, you, you have to stand... You have to stand uh, in your faith. You have to stand in your faith, stand your ground, even if it results in insult or in persecution. You got to stand your ground. Um, we may be at a time like that relatively soon. Some of you may be in a place like that even right now. Uh, you, you've got to, you got to look at these scriptures and realize they're not just written for people 2,000 years ago, they're written for us. And so, in verse 34, he says, You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. That's a tough verse right there. <laughs> because we have rights and we like to hold on to our rights. And you can't take my stuff just because I'm a Christian. And uh, we know in the United States that is true. And we should, we should uh, cling to those rights, utilize those rights that we have and stand up for those rights. However, they didn't have those rights back then. <laughs> they didn't have those rights in, in that situation. And yet, while their stuff was being taken, uh, stolen from them, confiscated from them because of their faith, they joyfully accepted it. They received it. They said, you know what? God has better for us in the future anyways. And so they rejoiced about that because they were, they were able to suffer for his name. But here, here's the deal. Uh, again, Verse 35, this is what I want to get to. So do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away your confidence. What is your confidence based on? Well, it's conf my confidence is based on my access to the presence of God and his promises. And so we just saw those things in the earlier verses that we were reading. And the, the writer here is saying, you guys made it through some of the toughest things of life 
uh, that you face so far and that same confidence that got you through it is the same confidence you need for what's coming. And you see how your confidence in Christ and your ability to approach Father God through a new and living way, holding on to the promises of God, that kept you through these difficult times in life. He said, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Now remember, we just read that we've got to hold on unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. And then he says here, you need to persevere so that after you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. When do we receive the promises of God that we're holding on to? We receive the promises of God that we're holding on to after we have done the will of God. And so the promises of God, some of them are unconditional promises, meaning it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> God's going to do it regardless of anything you do or do not do. Like Jesus said, I'm coming back. That has nothing to do with you or me and our obedience or disobedience. It's an unconditional promise that he said, I'm coming back. Now, I'm coming back and I will, <laughs> I will take you with me. Okay, well, that has something to do with us. Are we going to willingly <laughs> place our faith and trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Okay, so there's a lot of promises in God's Word that are conditional, not performance-based, obedience-based. It's not about being good enough. It's about following Him. It's about listening to Him, coming to Jesus, hearing His sayings, and doing them. And the Bible is telling us that we've got to have perseverance when it comes to the promises. Because if we want to receive the promises, we need to persevere and do the will of God and to continue to follow Him, or as it says here, to obey. We have need of it. And, and it's a, the promise fulfilled is a rich reward. The promise fulfilled is a rich reward. This is what God is trying to communicate to us. Approach Him with confidence because Jesus went to the cross. He paid it all once and for all for you and me. Deal with that guilty conscience. Don't let anything hold you back. Dig into the Word. Get the Word of God on the inside of you so that you can filter all this stuff going on through the Word of God. I'm going to respond biblically. I'm going to respond in faith. I'm going to respond with uh, honor and integrity. I'm going to respond with purity. I'm going to respond with grace. All of these sayings uh, are filtered through the Word of God. I'm going to respond with hope. Regardless of what comes my way, whatever news there is, whatever my experience is, I'm going to hold on to the hope that uh, I have because he who promised is faithful. I hope that encourages you today. Uh, if I can do anything to strengthen you in your faith, I want to do it. I want to pray with you. I want to partner with you. If I can meet with you in person, face to face, I'd love to do that as well. I understand. Let me just say this again. As much as I, I believe we should be meeting together, we should be gathering together right now, I understand that for some of you, it's not in your best interest yet. You are at a place where you're thinking, I need to uh, continue to, uh, to stay online and I'm going to be you know, able to connect at some other point. Let me tell you something. I'm so glad that you're online with us. Anything we can do to come alongside you and support you in this time, we want to do that as well. We want to mobilize people to be able to, to live out their faith in whatever capacity that, that God has called them to at this season. And so let us partner with you on that. Uh, if you are able to make it in person, come on out to the gathering place on Sundays at 930. If you're not, or even if you are, tell somebody about this online. Like it, subscribe to it, and uh, share it with somebody else. 
that's all I have for you today. Remember, our faith that God has given us, he's called us to live it out more than Sunday. Love you. Can't wait to be back with you next week. Bye-bye.